No, I'm on. Levels okay? Okay, morning everybody. I'm James. I'll start by asking if anyone actually has a 3D printer already. Okay, so there's a few experts in the room. So if you've got any questions at the end, just these guys are the, the people to be asking maybe rather than me. But just to give you a, uh, a quick feeling of the, the kind of things we're going to be talking about today, this is going to give you a, a very brief understanding about what you need to know about purchasing a printer, what it can do for you, and the basics about getting it working. It's not going to be an in-depth tutorial on CAD or uh, anything uh, more complicated than the basics. If you want to talk about that, find me later on and we can, we can talk about that. So, well, first, of all, first of all, we'll talk about the uh, various printer types that are available to you. The first kind is probably the most popular, which is uh, Fused Deposition Modeling, or FDM. It's uh, the most inexpensive type of printer that you can purchase, and it works by extruding a uh, very small plastic filament through a hot end and layering it on top of the, uh, the previous layer that it printed. And it works very similarly to a, uh, a CNC machine. So the next type is getting slightly more popular. It is uh, an SLA printer. It works by uh, using a, a resin and exposing uh, the resin with a, a, either a UV laser or a, uh, or a, uh, a UV uh, panel of some kind. The small ones are typically have a, uh, a panel in them the size of a mobile phone, and they produce far more detailed results than a, an FDM printer would. But they're more expensive. You need to cure them at the end and uh, um, to me, it's not mainstream enough yet. It's, it's a little bit uh, too messy for, the, uh, for most people to experiment with. Uh, then we have this kind. This is a uh, proprietary design. It's uh, called Clip from a company called Carbon, very similar to, uh, to SLA printing. The only difference is they, uh, they squirt in some uh, oxygen to allow them to change the temperature more accurately, and they also... Uh, during the uh, secondary process, they use various chemicals to change the uh, end result in terms of strength um, or, or, or makeup of the actual plastic itself. And then probably the most popular type in the commercial world is uh, SLS printing, um, or sintering, shall we say, which is where they get a laser and they sinter a, a material, and then a, a wiper comes over sticks the, uh, covers it back over again, and then centers the next layer, and the bed is continuously moving down. You're going to get the strongest results, or strongest parts, out of SLS printing, but most people cannot afford an SLS printer at home. So if you do require something that needs SLS printing, and we'll talk about that in a minute, you can send it out, and uh, companies will, uh, will print them for you. Not sure what you can see here, but this, all of my slides are going to be available uh, after the fact. But what this is showing you briefly here is uh, the various types of printing and what their benefits are. So if we just start at, at FDM, that is uh, certainly the cheapest and the easiest type of printer to be uh, purchasing, probably the ones that all these people here have got, um, uh, right down to SLS. But you can see the big difference is the accuracies at the, uh, along this layer thickness. So we'll talk about the, uh, the types of materials that you can print. Probably the most popular type of material that you can print with nowadays is PLA, which uh, is polylactic acid. Uh, ABS was probably the most popular in previous years. People are still printing with it. And each of these materials have different properties. Um, we have uh, PETG, which is typically a material that would be uh, your plastic bottles would be printed out of, so it's, it's more food safe, nylon. You can get flexible type materials if you wanted to produce a wheel or something like that. Um, uh, you can even get hybrids, which are uh, plastic filaments that have got uh, pieces of wood particles um, inside them or metal. And then you can also get infused particles as well. I, I haven't understood why you want an uh, infused material, but you can get uh, materials that uh, give off a smell of bacon when they're printing or even coffee. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure what the, uh, what the point of those are, but you can get them. So, you can't read that, so let's zoom in a little bit. 
So this is the uh, types of materials that you can get, and again, a nice little chart telling you all kinds of things about them, like the, the strength and uh, the temperature ranges that they can, uh, they can support. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the slides will be available at the end to allow you to look this up. But the, the biggest takeaway from this is when you print a part, you need to understand what you're going to do with the part to be able to know the type of material you're going to print from, because some materials um, are better with uh, UV exposure, some materials are better with heat. So if you have something that you want to leave outside, don't pick a material that's going to break down with, with UV. Skip that one too. Okay. So what could you actually do with a printer if you were to uh, if you were to buy one? Here's a couple of things that uh, I printed along the way. This was a, uh, a fix to my MFJ analyzer. I've got one of the early ones with a little button that pushes out, and every time I put it in the box, the button pushes on, and when I get it out, it's got a flat battery in it. Um, in later models, they put a, uh, a little button guard around it, but I don't, I have a problem with that button guard. I've, my fingers don't go in there too well. So I just caddied up a, uh, a replacement uh, button guard that I um, double sided taped onto the front. And ever since then, no, uh, no unexpected button pushes. Um, also down to boring things, for example, this is the uh, Pelly case that I've got for my K3. The big problem with uh, Pelly cases for me are these little uh, uh, foam squares. You can never get them to uh, stay completely square. And I wanted to take various accessories and things with me. So I just caddied up a box of the exact size it needed to be, printed it out, and therefore, I get no bending of the foam and uh, all of the accessories stay in there. Yes, I could have used some foam core or something else, but it's easy just to cut it up exactly the right size, hit print and walk away pretty much. Uh, the other thing, kind of things I've done, I think I showed this at a, a talk last year. This is an external control knob for the K3. I even printed the, uh, the knob itself rather than uh, uh, purchasing one. It's uh, got all the electronics in it, nice and handy. This is something I uh, downloaded off the internet. It's a, uh, a stand made of a couple of pieces, and you can use it for holding your, uh, your, your peak LCR meter. So you kind of get in the feeling of the kind of things you can do with it. This is a, a stand for the uh, Rigo, Rigol scope that I've got. This is just an example print. Keeps all of the uh, probes off the desk, supports the... Rigol gives you some space underneath it. That's the kind of thing it looks like. I didn't design that. I just downloaded it off the internet. It was a quick draft I, uh, I printed out of, of a, uh, um, a dipole support, basically, for the top of a fishing pole, various different sizes, depending on where you wanted it down the, uh, the fishing pole. And here's something I saw on the internet a few weeks ago. It's a, uh, an SMA spanner that uh, somebody designed and then uh, got printed in uh, what was it, brass or something like that by the looks of it, which is quite neat. So you don't have to just print in, in plastics. You can actually get metal out the other end, but that's probably not available to most of us. And here's an example of from the same guy. He was uh, producing a uh, QFAH, sorry, QFHA uh, form, and you can see here he's used some... Uh, um, uh, copper tape to form part of the antenna, which is quite nice. Maybe you're, uh, you're not into electronics and you just want to build a jig to uh, support something while it, uh, while it dries or, or holds it. These are all things that, when you can cut it up very quickly and print them out, they can make your, your life far, far easier without having to pop to a shop and try and maybe get something that doesn't exist, even just drilling templates if you're uh, producing a panel. I'm sure if anyone has ever built a panel, they've printed it out and then they've tried to uh, um, drill the panel out exactly correctly, and you might be okay, but maybe you'll, you'll be off by a mil or half a mil. You could print yourself out a nice little template, um, even down here, for example, with, with poles, with, with tubes. Drilling into a tube is quite uh, difficult, even if you've got a, uh, a pillar drill, so creating some kind of holder with a, with a template to drill is, uh, is nice and handy. Uh, here's something I uh, showed off last year. This is a, a malt bell, if you're a contester, because uh, D 
pinging the bill by hand is, uh, is too much hassle. So when you can uh, integrate it into your, your favorite logging tool and it will uh, it'll ding when you work a contact uh, or, a, or a malt, that's, uh, that's, that's far better. You can see here someone's even produced a, a Morse key. So if you can think about it, you can, you can put it together. And that's the, uh, that's the benefits. So let's talk about the machines themselves. They can come very small. And when I say small, I mean a device like that. I'm not sure quite what you could print with something that small to. Very, very large. Um, but they do get larger as well. So if you ever find your, yourself a, uh, a nice hill and you want to build yourself a house, you can, uh, you can bring one of these machines in. They do exist. They've started 3D printing houses in, uh, in France. And uh, uh, I'm sure that's the way of the future. This is actually the first 3D printer that was uh, sent into space. It exists on the space station at the moment. Um, they were printing various things. And then one day, they decided that they needed a spanner. So this is the first, it's not the first 3D printed item in space, but it's the first 3D printed item that they actually needed in space. Um, so they had a problem. They said they needed a spanner, somebody on Earth uh, designed it, sent them the files, and they actually printed it out. And this is a printout of said spanner. So it's quite small. It's got a ratchet mechanism built into it. I mean, it's not great. You wouldn't want to use it for, for work. But uh, it does show you that uh, anything's achievable if, you, uh, if you're desperate enough for it. OK, so what we're going to focus on is FDM printers. That's the printers that uh, you or I could purchase quite inexpensively, um, typically desktop size, and very easy to, uh, to use. So the first thing you would need to do is decide whether you wanted a Delta printer, which is this kind over here, or a Cartesian printer. This is probably the most popular printer, but uh, Delta printers are available, and they're typically better for printing taller items. So we'll talk about the Cartesian printers because they are, uh, again, probably the most popular. They typically have three axes, X, Y, and Z. And you can see here we have a, uh, uh, this is where the extruder would sit and the filament will come out and the various pieces move to move the, the head around to be able to layer the, uh, the filament. So these are the kind of terminology you would, uh, you would hear about if you were on forums or looking online about uh, 3D printers. So I'm just going to point you to a few of them so that you, uh, you, you know what we're talking about later on. So we have the hot end, which would typically be this part here. We have a heat break, which you can't see, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, linear rails, that's the, uh, the bars going up here. We've got some fans to uh, cool the, the uh, filament back down again. We've got the bed, which moves. We'll talk about that later. Various stepper motors that, that uh, actually perform the movement. We've got some lead screws, which you can't really see, but they are some sort of kind of threaded rod here. Various belts to move the elements around. An extruder set up here. Some bearings and a nozzle. So let's delve in and talk about what some of these items are. So this is a nozzle. This is a brass nozzle. They come in uh, various uh, sizes at the end here. 0.4 is typically the, uh, the size that you would, uh, you would get with your default printer and probably the, the most economical in terms of time versus uh, um, performance or, or uh, layer accuracy. And they are very inexpensive and you can, uh, you can get a whole pack from China um, very easily. The only thing is if you are printing um, using some kind of... Um, yeah, infused filament such as you know, metal or something like that, you're going to burn through these nozzles pretty quickly. So use something that's a, different than a, a typical brass no nozzle, a strength, uh, strengthened nozzle. So that's where the nozzle would sit. It would sit onto this heat block here, which is basically just a piece of machined aluminium with a, uh, a little uh, throat, as they would call it, up here. And it's got a, uh, a heating element in here and a small thermistor in here so that the machine is actually able to um, work out what temperature the hot end is because you adjust this depending on the type of material that you're printing. 
Now this would be the, the heat break. This plugs into the, uh, the heat block. And the idea here is you want this bit to be hot, but you don't want the rest of the printer to get hot. You, you certainly don't want your, uh, your filament to be melting up here when actually it should be melting just here. So that's what that does. And typically you would have a fan blowing on this as well. This is the extruder. You can see that it's uh, quite a simple design. We have a spring, we have a, uh, um, uh, a tooth wheel here and an, uh, an idler. And basically on this kind of printer, we'll, we'll stick to, uh, to this kind, the, uh, the filament comes in the top, the filament comes through here and is pushed into the, uh, the hot end down here using this, uh, using this geared tooth on the back of the uh, stepper motor. And if you want to release that, you would push this lever down, moves the idler out the way, and you can see here that uh, the filament would no longer be locked between those, and you can, fingers crossed, remove the, uh, the filament much easier. I'm sure you've all seen these, so we'll, we'll skip over these quite quick. These are what the belts look like. You can get various types of belts um, and various types of stepper motors, but just in case someone hasn't seen them, that's the kind of thing that they look like should you need to do any maintenance to them. So filament, typically it would come in two sizes, 1.75 millimeters, that's probably the most popular nowadays, and three millimeters. They would normally come on big spools like this, and you would pick a color, pick a material, and uh, away you would go. You can buy the materials, uh, you can buy the filaments from loads and loads of places. I did a bulk buy from Amazon, I found an extremely good deal on Amazon where I think it was six, six pounds a roll or something, but they wanted 10 pound a roll for delivery. So I contacted them and, uh, and said, well, I'm going to be buying 20 rolls or whatever it was. Um, can we do something about delivery? So they charged me 20 quid for delivery and I got tons and tons of uh, rolls of filament for a very expensive, a very inexpensive uh, uh, price. Again, Quality is, uh, is something you need to be looking for, so don't always buy the cheapest filament you can, you can buy because it may be rubbish, but actually, most of the time nowadays, um, filament is, is pretty reasonable, whatever price you pay. So, if you really want to get fancy, you can get printers that will take multiple materials. That's not just multiple materials, that's also multiple colours. So that allows you to print... In a, in, a, in a single print, more than one colour at a time. So this Prusa printer up here, I think, will take five different colours. Uh, this one, uh, this colour palette uh, design, will take four. And this particular one, I just found this image on the internet, but you can see here is uh, it's obviously taking three. But the benefit is not just printing multiple colours. You can actually print multiple materials. So imagine printing something out of ABS, but you needed a small part of it to be flexible. So you could actually print a flexible element within the same design. So it, you print one object that comes out finished. Or also, possibly, you may print um, supports out of a separate material that you can then dissolve in water, which is also handy. We'll talk about supports a little bit later on. But what it means is you now have a much easier time printing something rather than in a single colour. If you wanted to print an accent colour or something like that, yeah, you're able to do that in one pass without having to maybe paint it up later on. And what can you actually do? Well, you do things like that. I'm not really sure how related that is to ham radio, but there's a, uh, an example of a, um, a part that was printed in multiple colours in a single print. They literally hit print and the printer worked out what colours needed to go where and gave you a finished part. And you can do this at home for not a lot of money. So what is the process? How do you actually do this kind of stuff? Well, typically you would start with some kind of CAD tool. Here's a couple of examples. Fusion 360's uh, uh, my tool of choice is Tinkercad non-shape. They are... Um, tools which are based online in a web browser, so you don't even need to install anything on your, on your computer at all. And there is a, another tool, maybe can someone help me, what's the um, mathematical programming CAD tool, what's that called? Nobody? No, okay. If you like writing code, you can actually uh, um, CAD your, your, uh, 
your product up by writing code. Um, it seems too much hard work for someone who writes code all day, so I'd rather just visualize the, uh, the tool and do something different. But where I would advise you guys to start, probably, if you're not familiar with CAD, is Thingiverse. So what is Thingiverse? It, oh, we'll come to it in a minute, we'll come to what that is. So the idea is, at the end, you end up with something that we call an STL file. That's the important thing. So whilst you're doing your CAD design, what should you be considering to make your life easier next time? Well, the first thing is something called parametric design. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that when you're drawing your, um, your design out, maybe you want to make small, small or subtle changes to it that would be very painful to, uh, to change at a later time. Maybe you're designing a box like this. Um, it's got a length, a width, and a height. But maybe I want another box exactly the same with that that's double the width. So what you can do in the CAD tool is you can tie certain elements, lengths, diameters, angles, to variables that you program into the tool. So that means that if I want to double the width of this, if this was 100 millimeters, I could just change that variable to 200, and the whole design will just extend automatically. Everything will move. You're not having to try and shift things all in one go. So that if you were a box manufacturer, that's exactly what you would do, because you'd always got the same uh, wall thickness, you always want the same size um, threaded um, uh, hole mounts. So you could knock out a whole series of boxes just by changing a few parameters and only doing the CAD work once. Um, if you are doing a design that contains multiple elements, use some colour in it. Don't make it all grey or black or whatever the default is. Colour the elements themselves so you can see which bits are separate. You don't have to print it in multiple colours, but it just helps you um, visualise what's going on. Don't always try and make things in one piece. So, for example, this particular mount here that holds the uh, um, LCR meter is two pieces. It's screwed together. And the reason that it's, it's uh, best not always to try and make it in one piece is because you, will, you could potentially uh, fail in terms of strength. Because what you imagine is when you're printing something, you're layering plastic on top of each other. So all that means is I could get this and snap it in half straight along the, the joint that I layered the plastic on. So the problem is when you print, you always have to print in the uh, either. The easiest way is for you to print it with the least amount of support or print it in the way that you're going to get the most strength. So for me... This is the way I'm going to get the most strength and, and, and print it, but I printed it like this. What it means is these legs here, which is probably the bit that needs the most strength, actually have snapped twice on me here and here because there's no strength in those particular elements. And what I should have done is cut the model off here, printed them separately and screwed them together. And that's probably what I'll do. So yes, it was nice and easy to print this out fast, um, but I didn't think about that. And... Uh, it would certainly have been beneficial to have printed it in those two pieces. So before you hit go on it, try and consider um, how it might fail. Is 3D printing even the right solution for you? It's not always the right solution. Um, sometimes using a CNC machine is better. Sometimes just getting in the workshop and using a bit of wood or something like that. It's, it's not always the best solution. It might be the quickest, but it might not be the strongest. There might be other... Um, other issues with it. Am I reinventing the wheel? Have I designed you know, a, a dipole centre that 100 other people have, uh, have put together? Probably. So check Thingiverse. So what is Thingiverse? Let's see if we get to that now. So Thingiverse is a website you can go to where people are taking their CAD designs and they are uploading them for you for free and you can uh, download them and hopefully just hit print. And then you, there's various reviews on there. You can see whether someone actually cadded something that was impossible to print or whether people have printed it successfully or made changes to it, things like that. So more than likely, if there's something that you want to 3D print, check here because there's probably 10 of the same kind of things already on here. So you can just download and print. So you end up with your STL file. What do you do with it? Well, you can't just 
like you would with Microsoft Word, hit print. You actually need to do something with it. You need to be able to produce a file that the printer understands. And that, um, that printer understands something called G-code, which is the same kind of uh, language that CNC machines would use. And there's various pieces of, uh, of software out there that you can get free and paid for that allow you to uh, slice your model, essentially. You're slicing it up into all these various layers to be able to produce the G-code. So I use something called Simplify 3D, um, but there's various others that come. And I would suggest if you're starting now, you probably start with this tool here, Slicer Prusa Edition. That is free, and that is now very much catching up and about to overtake this paid piece of software. So don't spend any money. Use this free version here. So there's something else you need to consider when you're printing. That supports rafts, skirts, brims, and infill. So let's talk about what they are and why you need to consider them. OK, so supports. Imagine we were going to print this, this model here. So our hot end's going to come down, and it's going to lay a plastic on top. What do you think is going to happen when we get to here? It's just going to be squirting plastic out in free air, and there's going to be nothing for it to uh, print onto. So there's no way that I'm going to be able to print that arm. So what the slicing tool does is it produces a support for you. So it does all the calculations so you don't have to do it. It produces a very thin and uh, easy to remove layer of plastic that gets built up so it can produce a perfect, um, uh, a perfect print. At this end, you would take the model off, break off the support, you have a perfect model with his arm out. A raft. So a raft is something that you would typically print if you have an object that has a small surface area, i.e. the last thing you want if you were printing um, something, let's pretend we were going to print something like this vertically, you wouldn't do it like this, what you've got is a very small contact area on the bed. And any time that that was to move or fall over, you've ruined your print. So the idea here with the raft is if you have something with a very small surface area, you can essentially um, give it much more surface area and plastic to be able to grab on so it, uh, it won't fall off. Particularly useful if you're printing in uh, ABS um, because it stops warping. This is a skirt. I would suggest that you always print a skirt. It just prints a very thin uh, layer of plastic around the outside of the model. It's not connected to your model in any way. But what it does do is pre-primes your nozzle to make sure that you've got an ample flow through and also make sure that uh, your bed is perfectly level. We'll come to that in a minute. But the point is, you don't want to be starting to print, walk away, come back 15 minutes later and your prints failed because your bed wasn't perfect or there was a, a clog in your nozzle. So you will know within the first 15 or 20 seconds whether you've, you've got your, your settings correct. And the next thing is a brim, which is very similar to the previous one. The only difference is it's actually connected to the part itself. Again, stops warping a little bit um, and easy to remove. So what do we mean by warping? So we have this box here, printed it, printed it flat onto the bed like that. And uh, I ha didn't have something, uh, this, was, uh, this didn't stick to the bed properly. And now let's see if you can see the warp on that. Can you see that? So what happened was the plastic started to cool. And as it cooled, it started to lift off from the bed. And therefore, the whole print was ruined. So that's what you're trying to avoid, some kind of, of warping. And you can see it's... Is not good, but anyway. Also, you have a model. We, we saw that, uh, that person there with the, uh, with the arm out. Do I need that person to be completely full of plastic? Do I want it to be hollow? Well, if I want it to be full of plastic, then I get the choice. What kind of infill density do I want? If I do 100%, well, I'm just completely wasting plastic. But maybe I do because I want it strong. Maybe it's not. it's just a piece to sit on the side and therefore, the infill density can be a lot less. So you basically, you pick your infill density um, to suit the type of model. Now, one of the clever things that we're starting to see now on these multi-material printers is that the downside of a multi-material printer is every time that you need to change the filament, it basically has to pull the filament back out, push a new filament back in, and you're going to get a little bit of colour mix between the two. So what they do is they produce something called a purge block. 
So you're printing your model here, and then a purge block sits over here, and it basically clears that rubbish out of the purge block, uh, rubbish out the nozzle into the purge block. Well, that's a complete waste of plastic. You get your model, you get your purge block, you take your purge block and you throw it away. It's completely useless. So what we're starting to see now is the infill, the bit you don't see, is starting to be used as the purge block. So as you're changing colour, all that messy colour stuff is inside where you can't see it. So it's a, a uh, perfect reuse of, of the materials themselves. Do we have any machinists? I don't know, we've got one over there, but anybody else? Yeah, so speeds and feeds probably mean something to you. Yeah, okay. Same with 3D printing. Um, yes, you can print very fast. It doesn't mean you're going to get a good result. Um, each printer needs to be dialed in so you can work out what the best performance you can get out of your printer is. So the temperature of the, that you're heating the filament up to, the speed that you're moving the, the hot end around, um, all needs to be dialed in. So you just do a few practices to uh, work out uh, what's best for that type of filament and also for your machine. There is no, I can't just tell you a number, I can give you a rough number, but then you can dial it in exactly to your, uh, to your machine. So the idea is we're producing this G-code. Don't worry, you never need to look at this and it's never commented like this either. But the idea is you just have a machine-readable text file that you send to your printer. That's, that's what it looks like there. You can kind of see the kind of commands that you're getting out of, uh, of G-code. So we've got our G-code, we've got our printer. What do we need to do now? Well, we need to level the bed. So what you imagine, the bed is this, this plate that we're going to be printing on. And why do we need to level it? Well, we've got a hot end moving in all these directions here. If the bed is not perfectly leveled, the distance between the, um, between the nozzle and the bed will be different. Therefore, we won't extrude cleanly. Or also, maybe we will have our, uh, our nozzle collide with the bed. And that would be the last thing that we want. So typically, on the lesser, on the, the less expensive um, <coughs> Printers, you would level your bed manually with a screwdriver or some, some thumb screws. Or on the slightly more expensive printers, you can get auto le bed leveling, which is basically a probe which sits next to the hot end and probes in various places and then changes the, uh, the G code on the fly to be able to emulate a um, level bed. It doesn't actually move the bed around. You need to make sure it's clean, it hasn't got any rubbish from a previous, plint, uh, previous print. Um, maybe you, were, uh, uh, you had some previous adhesives on there to keep the, uh, the bed, uh, to keep the, the part glued to the, the base. But always, always clean your bed. That's what my mum told me. And <laughs> make sure your printer is homed. Typically, they would do that automatically. And if you're using a heated bed, as probably most printers have got now, your, your bed needs to be preheated, but your printer will do most of this for you. So we want our part to stick to the bed. There's lots of ways of doing that. You can use glue stick, which is a kind of PVA-based thing that maybe uh, school kids would use. You could use a PVA mix, which is just bulk PVA that you mix a bit of water in with. Uh, hairspray, guess why? Because it's got PVA in it. Um, you can use various types of tape, masking tape, um, capped on tape people use um, and basically stick it to the uh, to the bed so you've got a, a surface to print on top of. ABS slurry I've used that once and I've never used it again because I destroyed, <laughs> destroyed my, uh, my PEI plate which we'll talk about in a minute um, ABS slurry is basically you get some waste ABS and you melt it in uh, acetone and you create a uh, uh, a goopy mess and you, you uh, paint that onto your, your bed and then you print on top of that if you're printing ABS and that gives it a really good, you're printing plastic on plastic so it's a really good surface to, uh, uh, to uh, stick to. And then what I use now is a, a PEI plate which is, uh, for me, was an aftermarket piece of plastic which I stuck to the aluminium plate and as far as I understand it, it works uh, as if it's pores on your skin. So when it heats up, the pores open up on the, uh, on the plastic, and when it cools down, they close off. So what it means is there's, it's a nice surface for printing on, and when it cools down, the, the, the pores close up and basically allow you to remove the part much easier. And what we're finding is a lot more commercial printers are now coming with PEI plates as standard. 
For the types of tools you need, not many really. Um, blades and scrapers to pull the part off. It depends whether you're building the printer yourself, but if, if you've got a, a printer ready to go, really, bl blades to remove um, odd little bits and scrapers. Maybe some cutting tools if you want to remove some, uh, uh, some supports at the end, but not too much. So, where can you buy them? What do they cost? Prusa Research is probably the most well-known uh, printer designer at this point. Um, all of the cheap Chinese copies have stemmed from uh, Joseph Prusa's um, work. So anytime you, you see a printer that's got the i3 badge in it, regardless of whether it's from China, it's come from this guy's design at some point. Um, he is commercially producing them. And then various other Chinese websites uh, you can get them from as well, at Amazon. You could even buy them from Aldi at one point. Um, so that shows how mi mainstream they're, they're going. I'm not sure how many they bought because I think they sold out within a day. But uh, it's, uh, they're getting everywhere now. So this is the printer that I would recommend for anyone who doesn't really want to uh, tinker too much with, um, with their printer. It's the uh, Prusa i3 Mark III. It's just a basic printer, not multiple, uh, multiple hot ends, but you can see here the, the bed at the bottom there is a, a PEI plate, but it's also spring steel held on with a magnet. So when you finish the print, you can lift the plate off and bend it. And when you bend it, the part just pops off, which is really handy. Uh, it means you can change the plates as well. Um, this guy is selling them faster than he can manufacture them at this point. He has several hundred staff working for him. And I think he's even got eight people working in software development at the moment full time, which is incredible. All of his, um, all of his designs and software are completely open source as well. So the reason I recommend them is his giving back to the community. And the support is great. However, I didn't do that. I bought a really cheap Chinese printer. For, I, th I think I bought mine for about £100. Um, it prints. But as with anything, if you buy something very inexpensive, you get no support with it, and you have to do a lot more work yourself. I have not got auto bed leveling. I've not got any gadgets or gizmos on this at all. It's literally the bare bones basic printer. However, the Prusa guys have just release, released something called the SL1, which is one of those um, uh, SLA-style printers quite expensive, it's quite small, but if anyone wanted to create little figurines or something like that, that's far more suited to uh, something like that. So, modding, if you bought, were to buy a cheap printer. So, one of the things I did on mine is I just stuck a set of um, LEDs around the outside so it lights the part up and actually changes the uh, color of the LEDs depending on whether the bed's heating up, whether the hot end is hot, whether it's finished the print, all that kind of stuff. Just silly stuff. But the main thing is it's a nice white light um, whilst it's printing so I can, I can see where, where the print is and whether everything is, is good. Uh, the other thing that I did is put an external SD card socket on the top because these cheap Chinese printers put no thought into how easy it would be when it's on a desk to put an SD card in through the back of a, uh, a plate you couldn't really access. And if you drop the SD card, well, now you've got to lift the whole printer out and maybe shake it up. So it's very, very painful. So I just bought a cheap, I think, two pounds or something for an external SD card, which then basically just has a, a ribbon wire. It just means it's on the top, easily accessible, they could have thrown it in the, in the kit. The other thing I did is change the power supply out because these uh, Chinese kits have a tendency to put the cheapest and nastiest and even underrated power supplies in them. They've been known to catch fire, so I junked it and bought a more reputable uh, brand that had more power than was required and just put a new one in there. It meant drilling some new holes, but it was done. The other th problem that I had with my one is it came broken. It was a kit, flat packed, needed to put it together. The acrylic was broken. And the uh, company that I bought it from had no intention of giving me any support at all to be able to replace the parts. Um, so I super glued it together, hoped for the best. They gave me some money off of it, and I bought some, some filament with it. It's been, 
been good. But again, don't expect any support from these guys. How are we doing for time? Okay, finishing tips. Um, so potentially you've got some supports that need to be removed. If you use PVA supports, if you've got a multi-material printer, you can just dunk your part into water, dissolve all of the uh, PVA supports away, and then you have a perfect, um, perfect part at the end. If you're using something like um, ABS, you can use uh, acetone vapor to smooth the layer lines away from it. Of course, you can sand it, prime it, paint it, Gluing is a bit difficult with things like uh, PLA. You can get some materials that will, will glue it. Hot glue's all right, but super glue doesn't work at all. So you need, to, uh, you need to consider that. And the other thing that you can do is what they call annealing. Um, annealing the print, it's not really annealing it, but you, uh, you bring the print up to a temperature in the oven and you cool it down again. And uh, it's supposed to make it more robust. If you're going to print, um, parts that need to be joined together. So, for example, this, this is an early one before I considered doing that. This was just a, uh, um, a hole, essentially, and I just forced the, uh, forced the threads in there. Works once, but if you're taking it apart over and over again. So the easiest thing is just to get some cheap threaded inserts, and you can just get your soldering iron and melt them in, and it's literally as quick as that. That's really handy. You just if it's not a line, you put the soldering iron, you move it a bit more, and then oh, okay, away you go. I mean, come on, we're amateurs. <laughs> we don't do things properly. Safety. Okay, let's quickly run through this. You don't want one of those. It's a, it's a uh, burn, and luckily it wasn't mine. There is a risk of burning. I have burnt myself a few times, but nowhere near as badly as that because you're changing the filament maybe. It has to be hot. You forget where to place your hand, you place it in the wrong hand, and a fraction of a second later, you know that your hand shouldn't be there. Um, the hot end can be between 100 and 300, and the heated bed between 50 and 100. So be careful when, you're, uh, when this thing is, is preheated. The other thing is, a lot of these machines, the cheap ones definitely, are open loop. They've got no feedback to them. So if, you, if it's bringing the, one of the... Uh, um, if the stepper motor is moving the gantry over and you've got your hand in the way, it doesn't know that your hand is in the way and it will just keep trying and you've got a risk of pinching, your, pinching yourself. The Prusa model is doing some sensing on, on current and is clever enough at least to uh, back off a bit if it detects that there is a problem. There's a risk of electrocution. You could see that there was only a, a very simple uh, guard on the power supply, so if there's kids around, maybe keep it out of the way, all the obvious stuff. And then there's cuts and gashes. If you're using a sharpened painter's uh, scraper to remove the thing off, please don't be doing it like this or supporting the back of the bed and, and scraping towards your hand. Look on the internet, you'll see some lovely pictures of people who have really done themselves damage. And the other thing is the risk of fire. If you walk away and uh, this thing catches fire, maybe it's good to have a uh, fire detector there. Quickly run through this. Octoprint. So if you have walked away, what is Octoprint? Well, it's a small uh, application which can run on something like a Raspberry Pi. You can run it next to the, uh, the printer. It will control all of the printing elements. You can plug a webcam into it so you can remotely monitor exactly what's going on. And the printer can actually be shut down from this application afterwards. And it produces graphs of the various temperatures. But what it does is allow you to use another plugin called Octolaps. So if you were really good, I bet this isn't. Oh, here we go. Let's see if this works. It's not my laptop, so I'm not sure if it's going to work. That's a shame. If you care about that, then I'll show you later. But it allows you to create time lapse photos of the uh, of the print being produced. So looking after your machine, well. Just like a car, you need to uh, give your, uh, give your um, 3D printer an MOT. So keep the bed level, ensure the Z-axis is parallel. You've got two, uh, two stepper motors here. It doesn't take much to knock one and, and to be fractionally off. So just make sure they're, they're always parallel before you level the bed. Keep all of the uh, relevant uh, parts lubricated using the, the right lubrications. Um, keep everything clean and make sure everything is tight because you don't want the machine 
uh, shaking itself to pieces over time. And it would shake if you're doing very small infills. The thing is, is rattling, so make sure it's, it's uh, nice and tight so you don't get any, any ringing. Spools. Spools can unwind extremely quickly if you're not uh, paying attention. So always keep your filament either in your hand, in the hot end, or locked up in the, uh, you see at the very top there, you've got the, uh, the uh, filament holder has got a, a way to lock the, the filament in there. All filament uh, reels have got this, this material. If you don't do that, the filament will un unwind, and then you've either got to very carefully wind it back on because you cannot have the filaments crossing over as your print will uh, potentially fail. And if you are in a 20-hour print and you fail because you didn't wind it on properly, then uh, that's your own fault. They also don't like water, so keep them in a uh, Ziploc bag so that the moisture doesn't get in and throw in one of those silica gel um, parcels. And where we're starting to move to now is something called the master spool, which is people have worked out that when you get to the end of a spool, it's a complete waste of plastic, you throw it away. So some companies now are selling something called a master spool, where you, like on the left, you buy your filament with no spool on it at all. You print your own spool out of any old gash filament you've got left over, and you just reuse it over and over again. It's getting more popular. Um, anybody use Eagle for doing PCB layouts? Few people, okay. Anybody use Fusion for doing CAD stuff? No, okay. So if you are, if you do choose to use Fusion as your CAD tool and you're producing um, your designs in Eagle, because those two tools are now um, run by the same development company, um, they now interact. So you can actually take a 3D model of your Eagle design and move it into Fusion and then CAD around it, and then feed feed that information from the CAD back to Eagle. So if you need to change the shape of your PCB slightly, you can do that in Fusion and actually ship that change directly back to Eagle. So it's a, a two-way street. Both of those tools are free for um, <coughs> non-commercial use. So that's why I, I'm a big fan of them. And just to finish up, because I think we're slightly overrunning, is the hang printer. This is just a bit of fun to show you. You can get all of, the, uh, all of the bits that you require for a 3D printer here. So you can see we've got the, uh, the hot end and all the various stepper motors. But what's all of this fishing line all about? <coughs> well, that's for when you, uh, you want to print something that's a little bit bigger than would fit onto your desktop, maybe something that big. So you actually string it from the ceiling, and you can print something in as big a space as you, uh, you actually have. If you've got any quick questions, I can do them now. If you want any kind of in-depth conversation, then find me later. Yes. Yes. Well, I think you've also got the risk of heat with, with PLA. So in some of the summers we're starting to get now, where you only have to get up to about 50 degrees and the, the PLA can start to bow and, and bend. So that might be your... So if you get enough... So, for example, some of these... Th I've been given this talk a few times. I've pr got a few pieces here that I, I bring around that I keep in a box over there. I had that in my conservatory this summer and all of these parts all bent. And what I had to do to get this to straighten was just put it on an um, oven tray, to stick it in the oven, bring it up to 50 degrees, and it just all the bowing came out of them. But, uh, yeah, so PLA is probably not the best material to be using outside, I would suggest. But, again, it's super cheap, so if it fails, print another one. It's, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I would say YouTube is probably your friend. YouTube is where I learn all of my videos from. There's loads of 3D printing um, tutorials online where they show you all the kind of tricks and tips you would need with Fusion. Um, have you tried Fusion? Because it's not, it isn't AutoCAD. Fusion's a bit different. I can show you later. I've got, it, I've got my laptop here and just show you how, how quick it is to use. The other nice thing with Fusion 